Good evening, those joining us at the moment. Just about to start the uh, River Waterways of Northeast England. IWA a webinar held by John Pomfrey, IWA, member of the Northampton branch. Okay, John, over to you and I'll, uh, I'll kill my video. I think I've covered most points, okay? Well, hello everybody. This is John Pomfret from IWA. And today I'm going to talk about river waterways in Northeast England. So by that, I'm going to cover um, some Northern waterways, which I don't know how many people will, will be familiar with navigating them, the Tyne and the Tees. And then we'll come down to look at some of the Humber waterways, um, the ones to, from the air and cold around to the North, basically, as that's probably all we've got time for. And the Northeast River navigations, many have been used for freight since Roman times and seagoing ships and barges penetrated a long way inland on natural rivers and then canals extended their reach further. Um, but the early transshipment ports are often well upriver and then the typical pattern has been that things have moved downriver as vessels have got bigger. And we're talking here about vessels powered by sail um, for, the, for the most part, but also in some cases just by the tide. So there were um, traffics on the river hull and round into hull docks that were in um, craft without any engines and solely using the tide. And of course, when you get inland onto the um, more canalized sections of the rivers, where there was a towpath, then it was towage from the bank, often, often by the barge crew themselves because they couldn't afford to hire in a horse or a mule. So we'll start up in, in the northeast. Um, you'll all be familiar probably with the song Wheel May the Keel Row, the keel being a sort of boat that used to carry coal. And um, you'll probably also have heard the um, the saying about carrying coals to Newcastle as being as meaning something. Um, totally ridiculous because obviously Newcastle exported coal. Well, it used to, but actually until fairly recently, until we stopped using so much coal for power stations, it was actually importing coal. But anyway, let's go to the Tyne, to the home of the Keels and Wherries. So the Tyne, it's a 19 mile navigation, tidal navigation built on coal export trade. And at its peak in the 1990s, it was, um, it turned around to importing 2.7 million tons a year of coal. So although for several hundred years it had been one of the biggest coal exporting ports, it then became one of the bigger coal importing ports. But in the old days we had keels and wherries which took coals to the ships at Shields Bar because um, as with most uh, estuaries, particularly narrow estuaries, you end up with um, siltation across the mouth of the estuary and ships couldn't get in or decent sized ships couldn't get in. So you had smaller vessels taking the, the coal down and then people would load it with shovels into bigger ships. Keels carried about 16 tons by 1600. Um, and, but by the end of that century, by the end of the 17th century, they'd got a little bit bigger, over 20 tons. And the thing about the Tyneside coal trade was we had railways there from the late 1600s. There were lots of railways. Uh, all bringing coal down from collieries to, to load onto boats on the river. Um, and then as, as time went on, they built some piers out into the sea, which got rid of the problem of the bar. And then later in 1876, we had the swing bridge built, which allowed seagoing ships to go all the way up the river. And the river became just lined with coal staiths and shipyards and coal exports increased and increased to over 20 million tons in 1911, which was a lot when you think that typical ship sizes in 1911 were only up to you know, a few thousand tons at the most. But the, the river's now mainly leisure use above Jarrow because as, as I said at the beginning, ports, inland ports, which um, tended to be you know as far inland as you could get the ship um, because that you didn't want to have to stick stuff on roads because roads were impassable in winter and so on. Um, so the original port, the main port of Newcastle um, has now effectively moved downstream because the ships are too big to get up to Newcastle. And um, so the main port activity is below Jarrow and everything further up is mainly leisure use now. So from being a highly industrial river, as you'll see 
um, it's become really quite an, an attractive cruising area. And there are slipways and moorings available. And there's a new lock being built on one of the tributaries as well. So let's have a look. First of all, I keep muttering on about keels. This is what they were like, just a big box of coal in the middle of a boat. And again, I mentioned about boats going with the tide. Although keels sometimes put sails up, um, a lot of the time they just went with the tide and the oars that you see, the sweeps that you see the, the men handling at both ends were just to steer the boats basically. And railways, by, by 1750 or so, this was the, the, the extent of the network of railways. I mean, people think of, oh, first railway was stopped in Darlington in 1825. But in fact, there'd been railways for 200 years before that. And um, these were wooden railways with horses and rope haulage bringing coal down to the river. You can see they nearly all just go straight down to the River Tyne, which is through the middle there. And the other sorts of boats, slightly bigger than the keels and used not only for coal, but for general transport, were the wherries. Uh, the, we, we think of wherries maybe as being a typical craft these days on the Norfolk Broads, but there were wherries on the Tyne as well. And this is the last surviving one, um, the Elsick number two. Um, at the moment, it's in storage and unfortunately nobody's really spending any money on it, but at least it it still survives and could be restored at some stage in the future. Once, once the improvement works of the piers and the swing bridge had been uh, put in place, it meant you could get reasonable sized ships a fair way up the river. Um, when I used to work for the Water Authority up there and we used to do survey work out in the in the Tyne, you could guarantee that, that here at St Anthony's, the very narrowest bit of the whole river, we'd just get our survey gear over the side and be taking readings and things and here on the radio, ship coming around St Anthony's and we'd have to scurry out of the way quickly and get all our gear out um, because these things look quite big when they're bearing down on you in a little survey boat. And then up to Newcastle, which, as I mentioned, was the, the original main port. Um, to the right, the Spillers Mills, which at one time was the biggest flour mill in Europe. Um, but further up, you see where all the, the cranes still there on the Newcastle quayside. This was in the 1970s. Um, Newcastle was still an active quayside. And um, here we have another view, closer up view with a ship just coming in, a ship on the quay side, and another ship on the far side, on the right, outside Baltic Mills. We'll come back to Baltic Mills later on. Carrying further up, you see the oldest bridge, the high level bridge here in the middle, which has a railway on top and a roadway on the bottom, built by George Stevenson. Um, and then nearer to us, the swing bridge built in 1876, which was really the key to allowing, um, uh, allowing bigger ships up the river. In, in, in the mist, unfortunately, it was a pretty foul day. As you can see, there's snow on the ground. It was middle of winter. Um, you can see a bridge half built. That's the Metro Bridge uh, carrying the, the Metro light rail system that was just being built then when I took this picture. Um, there were five bridges in the center of Newcastle. And those of you who are as old as me may remember a band called The Nice who did an LP called the Five Bridges Suite, but now they would have to change it because it's now seven bridges in the center of Newcastle. We'll see the other one later. And further up the river, there were the coal staiths. This is Dunstan Staith, which is a scheduled ancient monument now. Railways on two different levels and the railway trucks came along the top and were either tipped or opened their bottom doors into chutes to load directly into ships. And there were these staiths all the way up the upper end of the Tyne. And the ship you see there is what's called a flat iron. These were ships that were built specifically to get up the River Thames to take coal to Battersea Power Station. So they were built with a very low profile so that they would go under all the London bridges. And here's, here's another example of a flat iron only with a slightly higher wheelhouse on this one. Um, outside Spillers Mills, so the ships could bring grain in 
to spillers and then go back out with a, a cargo of coal. And even right up to the top end of the river, um, we had wharves. And this is one of the Whitaker's barges taking heavy fuel oil, black oil, up to um, the Anglo Great Lakes nuclear graphite works, which isn't there anymore. And you can see how the steam coming out because the ship has a boiler, not for propulsion, but for steam heating to keep the oil liquid. Otherwise, you can't pump it out. It just turns into tar, effectively. Um, so this is a this is Newton LH. This is one of the barges that was built by Harkers at Nottingley on the air and called the navigation. And there were several of these found their way onto the time. And this is the very top end of the sort of commercial navigation. This is the Bessie Surtees, named after uh, a lady who eloped with a, a famous Steinside person. Um, look up the story on the web. And um, this is going up to collect fly ash from the stellar power stations, one on each side of the river, um, to take away for disposal. The other sorts of craft that was um, numerous on the Tyne, all the way up, because there were very few bridges, were the ferries. There's only one left now, and obviously, as you can see, this is quite a modern one. Um, but there were, uh, even in the 1970s, 1980s, there were six or seven different ferries operating across the Tyne. This one at, from North Shields to South Shields used to be a car ferry, um, because they've now built a, the Tyne Tunnel. There are still no more bridges between Newcastle and and the coast, but they've built, well, two time tunnels, in fact, to take the road traffic. Um, and so the ferry is just a passenger ferry. And you can see here, typical um, operation of modern ferry boats. This has got two propellers, one at each end, stuck down on stalks. Um, so you can direct the propeller jet in any direction you like. Um, you see there, the, the propellers are, are both directed outwards. So it's holding the boat onto the, onto the landing stage and um, you don't need ropes or any of that carry on. But now it's all very different. This is Newcastle Quayside, um, partly redeveloped. At the, at the time, this was a boat club building. Um, there's now housing beyond there. But still some of the relics of the past remain. At the back here with the clock tower is the Keelman's Hospital. This was a um, a mutual aid foundation set up to, to look after Keelman. And further up on the quayside, where all the black sheds and dock cranes were, we've now got some um, landing stages and trip boats. And so if you don't want to take your own boat up there, um, the, there are plenty of opportunities for having a boat trip. This is the, the last of the seven bridges that we have now, the Millennium Bridge. This is an opening bridge and on your left, you can see the Baltic, where you saw that ship earlier. This is now an art gallery, the Baltic Art Gallery. And the bridge is, I think, unique in the UK. Um, it opens just by tilting about 45 degrees, so that when, when it's open, the, these hydraulic rams swing it round on a hinge, so that the footpath and cycleway is tilted upwards and you get the headroom for ships. And it's all lit up at night, looks very pretty. Carrying on further, the Sage, which is now a major music um, venue, uh, classical music and folk music. Up through the swing bridge on a slightly better day than the previous picture. And we've got some moorings now right in the centre of Newcastle. So if you do visit by boat, you can moor up right in the, in the centre, just below the cathedral, which you can, you can see up on the hill there. And further up, there are moorings. At one time, the Port of Tyne was really a bit iffy about pleasure craft, but now they're really pretty accommodating and there are quite a few facilities. And you get up the top end and you're out in the countryside and it's all very pleasant. And there's a tributary called the Usburn, which has always been a haven for lots of little boats and, um, and pigeon lofts, as you see at the back. Of course, this is Newcastle, so there have got to be pigeon lofts. And um, it's, well, was tidal, but in order to encourage redevelopment, 
um, the, the city council wanted to impound water in there so that you didn't see the, the grotty bed. And um, they were stuck at the bottom. It's, they still haven't actually got the redevelopment that they're seeking um, happened yet. So I think they're still leaving the lock open at the moment, but um, the, the idea is that they will have it all impounded um, when they build all their posh new houses or whatever they're gonna build along the waterfront. And um, if you want to go and watch boats passing through the lock and so on, there's a convenient pub and on days when it's not raining like that, you can sit outside and um, see what's going on. And that's what it looks like when the water levels up. And up near the top, one of the old warehouses is now called the Centre for the Children's Book. And it's got this curious floating artwork outside it. And further up on the right there, the Clooney, which is an old whiskey warehouse. Uh, both of these buildings are now listed, protected. And the, the Clooney is a load of art studios and a performance venue. And there is a slipway there just on the left beyond the end of the building where you can put your own boat in the river. And further up, very pleasant valley up through quite a gorge with some spectacular bridges. And if you follow the walkway, there's a whole series of um, plaques in, uh, set into the walkway showing aspects of the history of the Usburn, which was a centre of the lead making industry and glass making and highly industrial at one time. So that's the Tyne. Tidal navigation with big ships. So just, you know, if you do go up there and go out in your own boat, um, remember to take your VHF radio and to listen to who's coming up and about to run you down. But there isn't much traffic above Jaro, and there are moorings available. There are slipways available. And for the opening bridges, you, you've got to check what the, um, the opening times are. And the Millennium Bridge opens at certain times each day, whether there are any vessels or not, as a sort of demonstration, because people like to see it opening. It's a bit of a tourist attraction. Um, the Swing Bridge only operates at certain times, and you have to request it. But you can get right the way up to, uh, way up to Wylam at high tide. And the next major river in the northeast, which is navigable for a reason, a reasonable distance, is the Tees. And Yarm, quite a long way up the Tees, 20 miles or something, was the second biggest port in the north of England in 1290. And again, the same things happened here. Yarm became too far in and for big ships to get to. So the port moved down to Stockton on Tees and now it's sort of moved down to Middlesbrough and, and further towards the sea. Um, Tees was also significant for the coal trade as well as chemicals and iron uh, and other minerals. And that's why the Stockton and Darlington Railway and the Clarence Railway were, were built, it was to bring coal down to the Tees for export. And some of it's artificial. So there are some canalized bits uh, along there where they've cut off great big loops to improve access to Stockton. And there are some fairly spectacular movable bridges, the Transporter Bridge in particular, which is one of only a very few still remaining. Um, but in 1995, they built a barrage across the Tees to impound water again to make it look nice and everything else in, in the upper reaches and encourage redevelopment. Um, and originally there wasn't going to be a lock, but the Northumbria branch, as it was then, of which I was a member, campaigned very hard to have a lock put in at the barrage and, and we achieved that. So you can now get all the way up to the upper tees through the barrage, through the lock. And there's 24 miles of navigable water. So it's quite a decent stretch and, and a lot of it is very pretty. So just to look at it as, as you come in, as you come in from the sea on the right, there's a bit called Seal Sons. And so the picture's just showing why it's called Seal Sons, fairly obviously. Um, and then you're in the current port area with some big ships and up through the transporter bridge where the, um, there's a trolley that runs across on this upper track across the, the top of the bridge and suspended from it is a gondola which will, takes about nine or 10 cars, I think, if I remember rightly, um, across from one side to the other. Um, the only other transporter bridges in the UK that I know of were one in Newport in, in South Wales, and then there was one inside a factory in Warrington in Crosslinks, which you can see from the train. 
And then the other big bridge was the Newport Bridge. This was a vertical lifting bridge. Again, fairly unique design. Um, it doesn't open anymore. Um, the, the port went uh, through a you know, process of getting the legislation changed so they didn't have to maintain it as an opening bridge. Although for a long time, ships still used to go under it to get up to Port Track Sewage Works to collect sewage sludge, um, but low profile ships that they could get under without opening it. Then we get to the barrage, which is where canal and river trusts um, jurisdiction starts. So the barrage and all the river above there is part of the canal and river trust network. And um, so, you know, it's a CRT license you, you need to go on it. I think your ordinary CRT license for the rest of the system does cover it if you can, if you can get your boat around there. But there is a slipway here if you've got a trailable boat. Anyway, this is the entrance channel to the lock. And we, in 1995, we held a, uh, a rally. This was the local IWA branch held a rally up there to sort of um, draw attention to the fact that now that the barrage was finished, um, there was a lot of nice recreational water. And these are some of the branch members in their boats. And I managed to hijack our survey boat from work and get permission to take it up there, um, which was quite fun. And we, we did poke quite a long way up the river. This isn't far from the limit of navigation. Uh, this is at Low Wersel, which was once a port. Um, in, in 1732, the, the Pierce brothers set up a port here. So this is even further upstream than Yarm. And um, they built warehouses and, and so on, but there's very little left. So if you think of visiting the Tees, just a few notes, big ships. And because there are lots of chemical ship movements um, with hazardous cargoes, if there's a big white light showing at the entrance, you're not allowed to come in until the ship's finished moving. But um, you call up on the radio and, uh, and the, the harbour master will tell you um, when you can come in and everything. And T PDT's port are, are the navigation authority up to the barrage. They're not really that keen on pleasure craft. So on the whole, if you, if you want to go up, if you come round by sea and want to go up there, you'll be encouraged to sort of pass through the port area without um, hanging around too much, really. But once you get through the barrage, then you can play around as much as you like. Um, and there are moorings available just around the corner at Hartlepool Marina, and there are slipways at various places. So um, it's the, it's well worth a visit, and especially if you've if you can get hold of some sort of trailable boat. There are, or there were, trip boats on the reaches above the barrage as well. Now I'm, you know, it's all difficult at the moment to know what's going to happen with trip boats because some of them are, you know, their businesses are in dire straits because of the pandemic, but hopefully there will still be trip boats when we're allowed to run them again. So that's the, that's the proper north. Um, we'll now go down to the south to Yorkshire, um, down to the Gares, that's the entrance to the Tees, turn right, turn right at Spurn Point and up the Humber, but obviously not in a, an ordinary narrowboat um, because ordinary narrowboats are not really good at going to sea because they don't keep the water out. Everyone says, oh, you can't go to sea in a narrowboat because it hasn't got a keel because it's flat bottomed. Well, that's absolute rubbish, of course, because 99% of the world's shipping is flat bottomed, um, but they're not very good at sea because they fill up with water because they're not designed to keep water out. So, We'll have a look at the Humber. Now the Humber is the key access route for lots of waterways and we won't have time to, to look at all of them. Um, but it's, it's a pretty important waterway, the Humber, and Hull was a pretty important um, barge place, really, it has to be said. The Humber drains 25% of England, so that gives you some idea of the fact that it's sort of quite big, <laughs> quite a big estuary, and it leads to a whole range of of other waterways, the Hull, the Ouse, the Air, which then leads to the Calder, um, the Don, which leads to up Sheffield and the Trent and the Ancombe. So very important connecting waterway. Um, the main inland waterway port's always been Hull for barges, but now with oil barges working there, a lot of them go down to Immingham and um, people are looking at whether we could use barges from Immingham for imported biomass to go up to Drax Power Station and things like that. So that's the, the sort of setup. So we've got the River Hull, 
we've got the, the River Ouse going up to York and then the River Yore above there, the Wharf, the Derwent, and then the River Air and the Air and Cold are leading up to Castleford and Leeds and Wakefield and so on. And those are the ones we'll have a quick look at up here to, to Sheffield and up the Trent up to Nottingham. Um, I have to leave those for another day because we, we don't have time to cover all of them. So this is about five o'clock in the morning, sunrise over Immingham. Um, you can see that uh, the Immingham area, Immingham to Grimsby area is um, a bit of a center for the chemical industry, but um, it's, uh, it's actually quite scenic when you've got the sunrise um, shining through all the smoke. And Potter up. Well, Hull is the first main inland waterway place we come to. And here we've got a um, 600 tonne tanker barge, which currently is working carrying lubricating oil up to Rotherham. So it does a trip once a week of 500 tonnes up to Rotherham, only 500 tonnes because that's all the, um, the recipient can accept at one time. Um, so that's keeping traffic going, admittedly uh, at a minimum level at the moment, but it is keeping freight traffic going up the Sheffield and South Yorkshire navigation. Hull, the old harbour in Hull always used to be the, the centre of barging and here's a picture from the 1970s, I think I took this one. And you'll see a, a mixture of these sort of barges on the left, typically used for grain, up to the many mills up the river hull. And then Newdale H here is a tanker barge, sort of similar ship to, to the Newtondale that you saw on the Tyne, one of the barges built by Harkers when the Aaron Calder was enlarged in the 1930s, I think it was, to take 500 tonne boats. And then on the other side there, you've got some bigger tanker barges. In fact, um, one of those is the same boat as the, the blue one you saw before. It's just changed companies and been painted a different color. So these are much more modern barges with wheelhouses that can be raised and lowered so they can see where they're going when they're out on the Humber, but they can squeeze under low bridges. And this is the, the scene as it used to be on, on the river hull with grain barges that came round from hull docks. And I mentioned that these just came round with the tide. You might be able to see hanging from the front of this barge on the right, a mud weight. Um, you had a man on the front end uh, manipulating the mud weight, lowering it or raising it. Um, and a man on the, the, the stern um, operating the rudder. And um, by using the mud weight just to keep the, the boat in line with the current and using the rudder to go around corners, you could get all the way out into the Humber, up from Hull Docks up to the entrance to the River Hull, quite a long way, and then all the way up the River Hull, um, just on the tide. So incredibly efficient in terms of um, renewable energy and so on. And there's a, a bit clearer um, picture of the mud weight hanging over the front. Um, still have barges going up the River Hull. Um, the, the scenery at the bottom end has changed a little bit because there's a new swing bridge in the background and the new, well, relatively compared with the other pictures, tidal barrier, flood barrier. And here you see two barges heading, heading up into the river. This um, front one, the yellow one's carrying edible oils, again, round from Hull Docks to, um, to one of the mills on the river. And it's quite narrow, the river. Um, so, the, the barges that go up there, like this um, petrol tanker, they can't turn around up there, so they're, they're going one direction backwards uh, as this boat is here. But when you've got the tide, that's, that's easy enough because you just face the tide and you can quite easily go backwards. Uh, as you can see, he can't turn around there. There's some interesting swing bridges, uh, uh, well, opening bridges generally. You saw a couple of the lifting bridges, but there are swing bridges as well. This is one of the old railway bridges um, built by the Northeastern Railway in 1907. Um, it's only a, a cycle and footway now, but um, it still swings. Here, back out onto the Humber and past Corporation Pier, which is where the ferry used to go. Uh, across from Humber to from Hull to New Holland, because there was no bridge over the Humber in those days uh, until you got up to Goole. 
to Booth Ferry Bridge. But now we have the Humber Bridge, which you see on the right. And as you can see, oil barge there heading up towards Rotherham. Um, it always, if there's a bit of a breeze, it always gets a bit choppy under the Humber Bridge. Um, and you pass other waterways on the way up. This is the entrance to the River Ancombe, where you can go up to Brig and Bishop Bridge as the, the mooring on that side where you can wait for the um, tide. And the, the typical trading boats on the Humber were sloops and keels, which were basically the same sort of boat, but just with a different sail rig. Unfortunately, they haven't got their sails up, but um, one of those, the, the outer one is a sloop with, which has triangular sails, and the inner one, comrade, is a keel, which has square sails. And they, they operated um, pretty well all the traffic on the Humber, and when you got inland, you just had to take the sails down and get out on the bank and pull it. There's some interesting little moorings on the way up the river, like Wintringham Haven, where you, it, despite the fact that there's lots of industry around the Humber, you could be miles from anywhere. And here we see on the, on the right two sloops with their um, triangular sort of rig, and on the left a keel um, with its square sails. And that's in a regatta, they used to have racing regattas. And these two are, are both preserved, these still operate. And you can see, even when you got inland onto the canals, if the wind was favourable, if there was any wind, um, they could sail incredibly close to the wind. So these two sailing in totally opposite directions using the wind. And that's Phyllis, that's uh, another sloop that's um, preserved. So about the Humber, well, it's tied all the ships and big barges and it's associated British ports look after it so you have to comply with their rules. Um, the voyage, there's lots of these light floats, they're like little ships, little um, miniature ships and as far as I know they're, they're unique. Um, and obviously people go up and down with the tide because that's the most efficient way to do things so ship movements tend to be concentrated around tide times and VHF is compulsory. Uh, there are places you can moor ranging from marinas like Hull, Hull Marina, which has got all facilities, to places like Wintringham that you just saw, if you want to be in the middle of nowhere. And there are slipways, but um, you do need to check to make sure you're going the right way because the sandbanks do move around. So if we carry on up the Humber, we get to the junction to Apex Point, Trent Ends, Trent Falls, whatever you want to call it, where the Trent comes in from your left as you're going upstream. And if you carry on, you go up the Ouse. And the Romans got as far as Borough Bridge. In those days, it was tidal that far. Um, it isn't anymore. And the Vikings found it quite handy um, for, for getting up and invading York. And if you go to York, you can go around Jorvik and see your remains of Viking civilization there. And York got a charter from Edward IV in 1462. So it was an important port way back then. Um, the navigation was improved by building a lock at Nayburn and then a lock at Linton. But that's all really until you get nearly to Borough Bridge. It's, um, it's mostly still a natural river. And then when the Selby Canal was built in 1778 to, to replace, the, um, replace the, the old ports on the, the River Eyre, um, then Selby became important. And you could go, it carried passengers as well, the Ouse. You could um, travel by steamboat from Hull to York um, in about eight to nine hours. But obviously once they built the railways, then the railways started beating those times. But they built a bigger lock at Neyburn in 1888 and the trade revived again. And there were, there were traffics until um, the 1990s, certainly there was sand dredge from the river taken into York and newsprint from Goole went up there. And in fact, there's been a, a recent traffic, just a, a one-off construction related traffic all the way up to, uh, to York. Um, now CRT control it. It used to be York City Council, but it's now all part of the C CRT empire. And certainly the use is easy enough to get to um, from the connected waterway system. So you don't need to worry about slipways or going by sea. Um, you, you can, from the Midlands, 
you can either go down the trends and in a kidby and, and around that way or you can um, come over from the manchester side over one of the three transpennine waterways and um come down to to selby and join join the use at selby without really going on any very big waters but down the bottom end near Goul, it is fairly big water and this is this is in the 1970s and you can see what would now look like a very old-fashioned sort of ship far too much shape for a modern ship as modern shapes are just oblong boxes really aren't they um but the interesting thing here is the three barges in the background so a motorboat i think there were two motor barges actually um, connected together and towing a, a third dumb boat but i don't know if you can see there oh, have i got it on the next picture no um the although there's a wheelhouse on this on the motorboat the poor chap on the dumb boat has nothing but a little sort of windshield in front of him and standing out in the open which you know it's one thing if you're um standing in the hatches of a narrow boat with your bottom half all heated up by the stove and so on on a fairly sheltered canal but when you're out on the big river like this with a howling gale blowing snow across in winter it must have been a pretty hard life really and that was in the 1970s it's not not in victorian times um this is a more recent picture of a barge called seagull taking um rice up to selby this was a traffic lasted for a little while fairly recently but um didn't manage to continue um and there are plenty of ships go up there both to Goul and howden dyke um here you see ships just below Goul. the far one is about to go into Goul ocean lock which is why they're they're about to pass wrong side um you hear the pilots say green to green yeah okay and they'll go the wrong side and this is further up this is the, actually the same ship uh, coming down from howden dyke and passing through Goul railway bridge there are two railway swing bridges on the, the river ooze both still operational and both on passenger lines you know on proper proper railways not just dock branches or anything um, now you see the you can see along the railway there the double track with the bridge closing and this is howden dyke uh, a little way up the ooze that's the furthest point that ships really go now um, that's another rice barge uh, tied up uh, overnight at, um, at Drax Power Station Jetty. But as you go up, the, if you want to avoid those sort of bigger bits of the ooze, then you can come round by the Selby Canal and um, it's much easier. I mean, to be fair, if you come round from the Midlands by the Selby Canal and come out into the ooze, that is much, much easier than getting back into the lock at Selby, um, as you can imagine. Uh, because the tide here can run pretty fast and if you come down from york on the ebb which you would do then um, you need to turn and face the current and um, you just need to be brave and put full power on and um, swing around at the last minute and you'll be fine and then it's quite fun having a railway swing bridge swing for you when you're just in a little narrow boat but um, when the tides when it's a big tide then uh, i used to have to get when I kept my boat up there, I used to um, have to get them to swing it for me. That's the seagull, the barge you saw earlier, unloading rice at the top end of Selby at one of the mills there. And there's another swing bridge at, at Kaywood. That one's run by um, North Yorkshire County Council. And the, certainly when I was up in that area, um, I think the bridge keeper got a bit lonely, really, because if you called him on the radio to say, can you give me a swing please um you, you'd be on there for about 20 minutes because he just wanted someone to chat so he got really fed up by himself but um i don't know if it's the same person on now and this is um just above uh neighbour lock uh this used to be the british waterways and later the crt offices in the area um but they got fed up with it getting flooded even though they they put flood doors across and so on um it was overwhelmed quite a few times so that they've moved to somewhere on higher ground for their office but there's still a keeper there and then as you get up to york um i say ships used to go up to york and um and this bridge used to used to open um and it's it's quite confusing really because these sort of arch type bits which you see there's a split in the middle um 
they're just for decoration. They just swing out, uh, out of the way. And, and the bridge itself, the road section just lifts up, um, hinged at one end, a buscule bridge. Um, but in order to make it sort of match in with the rest of the architecture, um, they put these artificial arch bits on. And if you go up to York, this is quite a nice place to moor. Um, I know I used to go up there regularly and moor up at Museum Gardens, which is sort of a bit quieter than outside the pub, but then, you know, in the evening, potter down to the pub, moor up there and then um, go back after closing time up to Museum Gardens. And I do remember walking out of there one time because with my narrowboat, the roof was just below the level of the uh, of the top there and I, I do remember walking out of the pub and just stepping onto the roof and there's this huge scream behind me <laughs> and this um, couple of Norwegian girls have been chatting to in the pub and they thought I just stepped straight over the edge into the water and then it's, oh he has a board <laughs> so um, but it's yes it's a nice spot and this pub um, is very used to the river because they get flooded every year um, and they make a bit of a thing of, you know, they, they stop serving when it comes to the top of your wellies type of thing. But they're very geared up there, you know, after the water's gone down, um, they're open again within a day or so. They just, they've got everything sorted out so that they cope with it. But a lot of York is protected now. They've got these big gates um, and that's under Lendl Bridge, one of the other bridges. The, the water level at the time I took that photograph was just above the, the top um, red and white stripes. So um, they didn't have too far to go. So the ooze, I mean, it is accessible, as I say, from the national network, but you do need to just do a bit of sort of preparation, reading up about it if you're gonna go up there, particularly if you're, if you're a little bit underpowered um, the tide can do seven knots at Selby, so don't don't try and go through Selby in the middle of the tide. And have some decent ropes aboard. If you come out at Ghoul to go up the river, then you'll suddenly find that it's a long way. If uh, even if the tide's fairly well up, it's still a long way to the top of the lock. And you'll have some guy from ABP up there saying, "Throw us a rope," and you suddenly find you haven't got one that's long enough to get anywhere near. Um, for bridges, you need a loud horn or, or better to call them on the radio. And the CRT locks are on the radio as well. And um, if you're going up from sort of Ghoul up to York, it's uh, well, between Ghoul and York, it's always best um, to, to go out of Ghoul in the upstream direction on the flood tide. So you go up with the tide to York. When you come down, it's best to go in at Selby because if you get to Ghoul, you'll find you're at low tide and the lock only opens near high tide and there's nowhere really to hang around in a small boat. So it's um, not brilliant. You just have to anchor. So it's far better to go back in at CLB. Um, and oh, and the other thing is uh, I showed you museum gardens and said it's a good place to moor, but there are steps there. So if the river's up, uh, don't moor at museum gardens because if the river goes down again, then you end up caught. And if you carry further on, it becomes the River Ure. It's the same river, um, but the Ure navigation, the Ripon Canal, were opened in, in 1773. Um, lead was a, a big um, cargo in those days from Ripon, but low flows were a problem in the summer. And eventually it was bought by the Leeds Northern, Leeds the Northeastern Railway, and they deliberately let it go to rack and ruin. Um, and the Ripon Canal was eventually abandoned, but it was reopened in 1996. And this is one of the nicest bits of waterway in the country, I always think. This is through Borough Bridge, Whittick Lock. Um, that's how it is in normal water levels. That's how it is when the river's a bit up and it's much more fun. And you can stop off at Newby Hall. And then you get up to the top end of this little cottage, won a, a design award. It's not actually a cottage, it's a sanitary station. And this is the very far end of the navigation in the basin at Ripon. And there are, sorry, there are visitor moorings just down um, on the side there within easy walking distance of the centre of Ripon. Um, there are limits if, if if the floods, if there are floods, the limits are really getting under the bridges. So you need to just check. Um, 
but the, it's this bit is CRT. There are marina moorings at Ripon Marina and at Borough Bridge. And the swale, that was naturally navigable. Um, they did plan to make it much more navigable, but and they got permission, but they, they never finished the works. But the bottom end was used until the 1980s. Um, and despite the fact it's got a no entry sign, you can go up it. Although when I tried, a willow tree had fallen down, but we did manage to get through on the left-hand side and get quite a long way up the river. Another branch off in, in York is the Foss. Um, this, this was used by the Anglo-Saxons as well as the Vikings. And in 1793, they built a lock. And the, the navigation was extended out into the countryside, really, to Sheriff Hutton by 1804. But it's the bottom bit that remained used up until the 1990s, in fact. Um, newsprint used to go up there to the um, Yorkshire Press. Um, City of York is still the navigation authority there, but we, we negotiated that volunteers could work the lock instead of having to pay £25 to get um, a, a city council employee out, and that's the, the current arrangement. This is Castle Mills Lock, which is taking the Mayor of York up through the lock on the occasion of a boat rally we had there. And you're right through past some very historic buildings, historic Roundtree's warehouse. Uh, up the top end where um, they used to take sand up there uh, from the river. This is back in the 70s. And that's the same boat now converted. And this was uh, a whole crowd of us showing how far we could get up there. And carrying on down, doing other tributaries, the, the wharf has always been an open navigation. They had proposals for locks, but they never um, they never were implemented, um, but you can still go up there, um, up through the new railway viaduct. This is when the East Coast Main Line was diverted to allow them to exploit the Selby coal field. And the limit of navigation is up at Tadcaster, where there's a weir, but you can moor up with you know a certain amount of um, fiddling about to try and get into the bank. And um, there was time to go to the pub before the tide turned. Um, but in 2015, they had some fairly disastrous floods there, which sort of slightly washed away the bridge. But um, it has been restored, and there was a grand reopening two years later. You can see the new section of the bridge there, and all that spoil has been removed from the river. So once again, you could get a boat up there. The only other place you can stop is this jetty at Nun, um, Nun Nun Appleton, sorry. Um, but it was a handy place to tie on to to have lunch. So obviously it's tidal. You need to um, time your, 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 your trip um, so you can go out and back on one tide and um, get back to, to neighbour and look. And the final tributary we'll look at, the Derwent. Um, this, this was tidal to, possibly tidal to Stamford Bridge. Um, uh, the York Corporation took it over in the 1460s when, when they got their charter, and it was eventually made navigable to Malton, but it was um, officially closed in 1936, and, but Sutton Lock was reopened in 1972, um, and they built a barrage at the bottom end, which makes the bottom end more navigable. But um, unfortunately, Sutton Lock has been closed again by the, by the Environment Agency, or not the Navigation Authority, but they own the top gate, and um, uh, we need to negotiate how to get it reopened again. But this is Barnby Barrage. This is on the way up. Very low banks on the River Derwent, so it's actually quite nice because you can see where you're going, you can see the countryside. And this is Sutton Lock, um, and this is on the left is the gate that the Environment Agency have closed because it needs some repairs for safety reasons. And the bottom gate in a poor state, but the, due to a complicated court case, they belong to Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, who are not being terribly keen on having them replaced. So um, we've got a bit of a problem there at the moment. Further up, um, when Sutton Lock is working, you can get Stamford Bridge and they see the remains of the next lock. 
Um, so at the moment, you can only get up to Sutton, but it's still an important access to the Bocklington Canal, and that's definitely worth going to, although that's not a river waterway, so I'm not going to mention it particularly. And then finally, the air. Um, we're slightly getting short on time here, so I'll just give you a quick whistle stop tour. But originally the air was made navigable up to Leeds and then gradually bits of it were replaced by the Selby Canal initially and then by the Goul and Nottingley Canal. And um, it's been continuously improved over the years. So now it'll take 650 tonne boats. And this is where the original port was at Airmin, but there's nothing left basically. You can't see anything, but you can still go up the, the river air. There are still moorings for barges. But most of the traffic was diverted through the Selby Canal and Selby became the main port. This is the entrance from the river air. Um, typical air and cold to lock gear. And um, that's the one of the locks on, on the river itself. As you come off the Selby Canal and head towards Leeds, uh, this is Bank Dole Lock. But the I'll say they, first it was airmen on the air, then it was the port became Selby, and lastly they built the Goul and Nottingley Canal, built a completely new town at Goul on filled in land, and Goul became the port. And this is Ocean Lock at Goul, which, as you see, is quite a decent sized lock. A ship waiting to go out. I was wondering why he wasn't going, but then suddenly saw this other ship coming backwards at high speed up the river. Um, he'd, he'd swung below Goul and was racing up backwards to, to more up and wait to go in through the other lock at Goul, Victoria Lock, because he's too long to go through this lock. And um, see a typical river sea ship arrangement these days where you have the wheelhouse on a stalk so that you can see where you're going. But then when you get to low bridges on inland waterways, you can get under them. And of course, modern ships with bow thrusters and modern stern gear can manoeuvre themselves He's just come through the lock, through a swing bridge, and he's turning right round to go on to a berth. These are barges in Ocean Lock, another ship and the steel terminal at Goul. And then working our way up the canal, here we see um, Farndale, which is currently just started on a new traffic of aggregates up to Leeds. And um, Brantford's have been running barges for about five generations. But historically, coal was very important. Um, and one of the things they did there was Bartholomew, the engineer of the Aaron Calder, um, invented these compartment boats called Tom Puddings, which could be pulled out of the water, filled at the colliery, and shoved back into the water. And were towed around in great long trains down to Goul, uh, put under the dust, and tipped, bodily tipped into ships. And um, they kept going for quite a long time. There are a few preserved. And that's the J bus or the front end that was, was put at the front of the train to, to make it less resistant to the water. And this is one of the tugs. Carrying on further upstream, that's where the um, more modern version of the Tom Puddings were being loaded. And until Ferrybridge Power Station closed, coal was taken from this colliery in these rather bigger versions of Tom Puddings, which were unloaded in just the same way. Now you see loaded one being pushed, um, but the empty one, empty ones being pulled, because if you try and push the empty ones, you can't see where on earth you're going, but it doesn't matter because the propeller wash can go underneath them. Oil tankers, we still have oil tankers moving around on the waterways. And there are plans afoot to enlarge the waterway even more. One of the pinch points is this bit of Bulloom Lock. So these little bits in the bottom of the lock actually restrict the size of boat you can get up there. And um, we're pushing to try and get those removed. And Castleford Flood Lock has a bend in it, so that needs sorting out as well to get bigger boats up there. Um, there are various options being looked at for that. And above Castleford Floodlock, you can go straight on up the river air, or you can turn right like the boat in front of us is. Uh, uh, sorry, go straight on up the Calder, or you can turn right like the boat in front of us is up the air. Some of the air got washed away when it all fell into a big open cast coal site. So this lock at Kipax isn't there anymore, and there's a new bit of river that you go up. And this is the new traffic that's just started um, on its way up to, to Leeds. At the top, you get to Leeds Lock, and centre of Leeds has all been redeveloped around the, the canal basin. 
but it used to be a very industrial waterfront. These are coal barges at the Co-op Coal Wharf in Leeds back in the 1960s. So the, yeah, tidal reaches are sort of probably an adventure waterway, but the non-tidal reaches are, are fine. Um, from, where, from Castleford, where that floodlock is, I said, you go straight on up the Calder. That's a branch of the Aaron Calder. There you see a, a, a gravel boat going up there when the traffic used to go up to a place called Whitwood. And that's it being unloaded. And there's, um, it's gradually been improved. So this is one of the old lines um, with shorter locks. And then there's a new um, lock been built to divert it around two of the old locks. So that the Aaron Calder are like that. There are so many different historic routes. They've changed and changed and changed. And Stanley Ferry Aqueduct, the original aqueduct, that was replaced by a new one, which you see in the background, um, to, to enable bigger boats. And that's where one of CRT's main lock gate making workshops is. Up through Wakefield, you get onto the Calder and Hebel, where the locks are operated. You don't have a windlass, you have a hand spike. You stick your piece of wood in there and turn it around a quarter of a turn, then stick it in again and turn it around. And as you go up there, you get to the um, to Serby Bridge, where it joins onto the Rochdale Canal. Just a, a, a point there about tides in estuaries, that um, tides get distorted. So if you're going up with a flood tide, flood tides are very quick and only last for a short length of time. So you've got to get it right to actually carry the flood tide with you. Ebb tides last much longer and you have a lot more. Um, leeway. So there are a few notes there which um, I'm not going to read through all those but if uh, th this will be on um, on the website available afterwards so if anyone's interested in going up it's maybe worth a quick read through some of the bullet points there. And that's it. Sorry it took slightly longer than I was hoping but um, this is the Humber Bridge of course and uh, the old ditty about Will they ever cross the Humber? Will they ever bridge it? Or is it always the exception to the rule? Is it such a privilege not to have a Humber Bridge and to have to keep on going around by Google? Thank you. Okay, fine. Thanks for that, John. And uh, thanks for all the uh, very interesting presentation. I shall look forward to the follow-on when we get around to it. <laughs> yeah, no problems at all. Um, there's been, uh, there's two questions come up so far. Anne Riles asked the question, where does the rice come from, it's from your presentation? Well, that, in that case, the rice was coming in from America. And in fact, those the yellow barges that you saw um, moored up at um, uh, Drax Power Station, they were lash barges, lighter mm -hmm. aboard ship barges, in okay. the days when the lash service used to come into Hull or mm -hmm. off Hull. Um, so yeah, they, they, uh, the rice comes from America. I, I'm not sure where exactly in America it's grown. I mean, I think it's loaded at New Orleans or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chaz Warren's asked the question, is it practical to navigate down the Trent to then explore all the waterways you've discussed? Yes, I mean, it, it depends what sort of boat you've got and how big a boat you've got. Um, most sort of inland boats going down the Trent from the Midlands would go in at Kidby, um, but there is a limitation there that Thornlock um, won't take a full length narrowboat. So if you have a full length narrowboat, you'll have to go around Trent End, which is fine, people have done, but you just need to sort of plan it a bit. Um, but for, for most inland boats, most narrowboats will go down, go in at Kidby, along the Stainforth and Kidby Canal, um, and, and then turn right at the end through Syke House and down to Goul. And then from Goul, you can go round mm -hmm. um, to Selby and come out at Selby. So you don't have to, you don't have to actually go on the Humber or the lower bits of the Ouse or the Trent. Um, you can get up to York and everywhere quite happily. And of course, the Aaron Calder you can get to from from the other side. You you know you come over yeah. the Leeds and Liverpool from Manchester. That's what we. I've done that myself a few years yeah. back. It was very good. Um, Charles Warren also said the presentation was very comprehensive and at speed. Is it possible to access the slides for study, please? Well, this is being recorded, so at some later stage, Charles, this will be available. Uh, for you to look at and enjoy, as we say. Yes, John? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so all the webinars are, are available um, on the website somewhere. <laughs> um, 
if if anyone has any problem um sort of knowing where where to find things um kind of suggest maybe you um email Gemma Bolton at head office and she'll be able to let you know when it's available okay Chess says thank you for that and Derek Humphrey's great photography over a very large obviously a large time span so yeah, well, it yeah. was a while back, and when when you were a lad, when Adam was when, I, when I was a lad, I know <laughs> <laughs> that's what was a, a long time ago. Yeah. I know it was a good few years ago. <laughs> very well done, John. We, we look forward to the next one though, because it was very interesting, and I've seen the other part of the presentation you've done before as well. I think we should add that in at a later stage in the next couple of months. We'll see how we get on with that. But we'll miss okay. the, the missing waterways will be covered. John <laughs> Pomfrey is a member of the IWA Northampton branch and IWA. And for many many years i'm branch chairman of the northampton branch and uh, and the webinar has been uh, very very enjoyable thank you john and thank you for everybody who's, in, who's uh, been here and listened to it all and uh, we look forward to the next one thanks john cheers thank you thanks for listening Bye.